Heroism by Ralph Waldo Emerson from Essays First Series, 1841. Paradise is under the shadow of swords, Mahomet. Ruby wine is drunk by knaves, sugar spends to fatten slaves. Rose and vine leaf deck buffoons, thunderclouds are Jove's festoons. Drooping oft in wreaths of dread, lightning nodded round his head. The hero is not fed on sweets, daily his own heart he eats. Chambers of the great are jails, and headwinds right for royal sails. In the elder English drama etcher, there is a constant recognition of gentility, as if a noble behavior were as easily marked in the society of their age as color is in our American population. When any Rodrigo, Pedro, or Valerio enters, though he be a stranger, the duke or governor exclaims, This is a gentleman and proffers civilities without end, but all the rest are slag and refuse. In harmony with this delight in personal advantages, there is in their plays a certain heroic cast of character and dialogue, as in Bonduca, Sophocles, The Mad Lover, The Double Marriage, wherein the speaker is so earnest and cordial, and on such deep grounds of character, that the dialogue, on the slightest additional incident in the plot, rises naturally into poetry. Among many texts, take the following. The Roman Martius has conquered Athens. All but the invincible spirits of Sophocles, the Duke of Athens, and Dorigan, his wife. The beauty of the latter inflames Martius, and he seeks to save her husband. But Sophocles will not ask his life, although assured that a word will save him, and the execution of both proceeds. Valerius, bid thy wife farewell. Sophocles, no, I will take no leave, my Dorigan, yonder above, about... Ariadne's crown, my spirit shall hover for thee. Prithee haste. Dorgan. Stay, Sophocles, with this tie up my sight. Let not soft nature so transformed be, and lose her gentler sex humanity to make me see my lord bleed. So tis well, never one object underneath the sun will I behold before my Sophocles. Farewell, now teach the Romans how to die. Martius. Dost know what tis to die? Sophocles. Thou dost not, Martius, and therefore not what tis to live. To die is to begin to live. It is to end an old, stale, weary work, and to commence a newer and a better. Tis to leave deceitful knaves for the society of gods and goodness. Thou thyself must part at last from all thy garlands, pleasures, triumphs, and prove thy fortitude. What then twill do? Valerius, but art not grieved nor vexed to leave thy life thus? Sophocles, why should I grieve or vex for being sent to them I ever loved best? Now I'll kneel, but with my back toward thee, tis the last duty this trunk can do the gods. Martius. Strike, strike, Valerius, or Martius' heart will leap out at his mouth. This is a man, a woman, kiss thy lord, and live with all the freedom you were wont. O oh, love, thou doubly hast afflicted me with virtue and with beauty, treacherous heart. My hand shall cast thee quick into my urn, ere thou transgress this knot of piety. Valerius, what ails my brother? Sophocles, O oh, Martius, O oh, Martius, thou now hast found a way to conquer me. Dorigan, O oh, star of Rome, what gratitude can speak fit words to follow such a deed as this? This ad Martius, this admiral duke Valerius, with his disdain of fortune and of death, captived himself, has captivated me, and thou my arm hath taken his body here, his soul hath, hath subjugated Martius' soul by Romulus. He is all soul, I think. He hath no flesh, and spirit cannot be given. Then we have vanquished nothing. He is free, and Martius walks now in captivity. I do not readily remember any poem, play, sermon, novel, or oration that our press vents in the last few years, which goes to the same tune. We have a great many flutes and flagellates, but not often the sound of any fife. Yet Wordsworth's Laudamia and the Ode of Dion and some sonnets have a certain noble music, and Scott will sometimes draw a stroke like the portrait of Lord Evandale given by Balfour of Burley. Thomas Carlyle, with his natural taste for what is manly and daring in character, has suffered no heroic trait in his favorites to drop from his biographical and historical pictures. Earlier, Robert Burns has given us a song or two. In the Harleian Miscellanies, there is an account of the Battle of Lutzen, which deserves to be read, and Simon Ockley's History of the Saracens recounts the prodigies of individual valor 
with admiration all the more evident on the part of the narrator that he seems to think that his place in christian oxford requires of him some proper protestations of abhorrence but if we explore the literature of heroism we shall quickly come to plutarch who is its doctor and historian to him we owe the Brasidas, the Dion, the Epimonides, the Scipio of old, and I must think we are more deeply and indebted to him than to all the in ancient writers. Each of his lives is a refutation to the despondency and cowardice of our religious and political theorists. A wild courage, a stoicism not of the schools, but of the blood, shines in every antidote and has given that book its immense fame. We need books of this tart, cathartic virtue more than books of political science or of private economy. Life is a festival only to the wise. Seen from the nook and chimney side of prudence, it wears a ragged and dangerous front. The violations of the laws of nature by our predecessors and our contemporaries are punished in us also. The disease and deformity around us certify the infraction of natural, intellectual, and moral laws, and often violation on violation to breed such compound misery. A lockjaw that bends a man's head back to his heels, hydrophobia that makes him bark at his wife and babes, insanity that makes him eat grass, war, plague, cholera, famine, indicate a certain ferocity in nature which, as it had its inlet by human crime, must have its outlet by human suffering. Unhappily, no man exists who has not in his own person become, to some amount, a stockholder in the sin, and so made himself liable to a share in the expiation. Our culture, therefore, must not omit the arming of the man. Let him hear in season that he is born into the state of war, and that the commonwealth and his own well-being require that he should not go dancing in the reeds of peace, but warned, self-collected, and neither defying nor dreading the thunder, let him take both reputation and life in his hand, and, with perfect urbanity, dare the gibbet and the mob by the absolute truth of his speech and the rectitude of his behavior. Towards all this external evil, the man within the breast assumes a warlike attitude and affirms his ability to cope single-handed with the infinite army of enemies. To this military attitude of the soul we give the name of heroism. Its rudest form is the contempt for safety and ease, which makes the attractiveness of war. It is a self-trust which slights the restraints of prudence in the plenitude of its energy and power to repair the harms it may suffer. The hero is a mind of such balance that no disturbances can shake his will. But pleasantly, and as it were merrily, he advances to his own music alike in frightful alarms and in the tipsy mirth of universal dissoluteness. There is somewhat not philosophical in heroism. There is somewhat not holy in it. It seems not to know that other souls are of one texture with it. It has pride. It is the extreme of individual nature. Nevertheless, we must profoundly revere it. There is somewhat in great actions which does not allow us to go behind them. Heroism feels and never reasons, and therefore is always right. And although a different breeding, different religion, and greater intellectual activity would have modified or even reversed the particular action, yet for the hero that thing he does is the highest deed, and is not open to the censure of philosophers or divines. It is the avowal of the unschooled man that he finds a quality in him that is negligent of expense, of health, of life, of danger, of hatred, of reproach, and knows that his will is higher and more excellent than all actual and all possible antagonists. Heroism works in contradiction to the voice of mankind, and in contradiction for a time to the voice of the great and good. Heroism is an obedience to a secret impulse of an individual's character. Now to no other man can its wisdom appear as it does to him, for every man must be supposed to see a little farther on his own proper path than anyone else. Therefore, just and wise men take umbrage at his act until after some little time be passed, then they see it to be in unison with their acts. All prudent men see that the action is clean contrary to a sensual prosperity, for every heroic act measures itself by its contempt of some external good, but it finds its own success at last, and then the prudent also extol. 
self-trust is the essence of heroism it is the state of the soul at war and its ultimate objects are the last defiance of falsehood and wrong and the power to bear all that can be inflicted by evil agents it speaks the truth and it is just generous hospitable temperate scornful of petty calculations and scornful of being scorned it persists it is of an undaunted boldness and of a fortitude not to be wearied out its jest is the littleness of common life that false prudence which dotes on health and wealth is the butt and merriment of heroism heroism like plotinus is almost ashamed of its body what shall it say then to the sugar plums and cats cradles to the toilet compliments quarrels cards and custard which rack the wit of all society what joys has kind nature provided for us dear creatures there seems to be no interval between greatness and meanness when the spirit is not master of the world then it is its dupe yet the little man takes the great hoax so innocently works in it so headlong and believing is born red and dies gray arranging his toilet attending on his own health laying traps for sweet food and strong wine setting his heart on a horse or a rifle made happy with a little gossip or a little praise that the great soul cannot choose but laugh at such earnest nonsense indeed these humble considerations make me out of love with greatness what a disgrace it is it to me to take note how many pairs of silk stockings thou hast namely these and those that were the peach-coloured ones or to bear the inventory of thy shirts as one for superfluity and one other for use citizens thinking after the laws of arithmetic consider the inconvenience of receiving strangers at their fireside reckon narrowly the loss of time and the unusual display the soul of a better quality thrusts back the unseasonable economy into the vaults of life and says i will obey the god and the sacrifice and the fire he will provide ibn hakel the arabian geographer describes a heroic extreme in the hospitality of sogid in bukharia when i was in sogid i saw a great building like a palace the gates of which were open and fixed black back to the wall with large nails i asked the reason and was told that the house had not been shut night or day for a hundred years strangers may present themselves at any hour and in whatever number the master has amply provided for the reception of the men and their animals and is never happier than when they tarry for some time nothing of the kind have i seen in any other country the magnanimous know very well that they who give time or money or shelter to the stranger so it be done for love and not for ostentation do as it were put god under obligation to them so perfect are the compensations of the universe in some way the time they seem to lose is redeemed and the pains they seem to take remunerate themselves these men fan the flame of human love and raise the standard of civil virtue among mankind but hospitality must be for service and not for show or it pulls down the host the brave soul rates itself too high to value itself by the splendor of its table and draperies it gives what it hath and all it hath but its own majesty can lend a better grace to bannocks and fair water than belong to city feasts the temperance of the hero proceeds from the same wish to do no dishonor to the worthiness he has but he loves it for its elegancy not for its austerity it seems not worth his while to be solemn and denounce with bitterness flesh-eating or wine-drinking the use of tobacco or opium or tea or silk or gold a great man scarcely knows how he dines how he dresses but without railing or precision his living is natural and poetic john eliot the indian apostle drank water instead of wine it is a noble generous liquor and we should be humbly thankful for it but as i remember water was made before it better still is the temperance of king david who poured out on the ground unto the lord the water which three of his warriors had brought him to drink at the peril of their lives it is told of brutus that when he fell on his sword after the battle of philippi he quoted a line of euripides o virtue i have followed thee through life and i find thee at last but a shade <clears throat> i doubt not the hero is slandered by this report the heroic soul does not sell its justice and its nobleness it does not ask to dine nicely and to sleep warm the essence of greatness is the perception that virtue is enough poverty is its ornament it does not need plenty and can very well abide its loss <clears throat> but that which takes my fancy most in the heroic class is the good humor and hilarity they exhibit 
it is a height to which common duty can very well attain to suffer and to dare with solemnity but these rare souls set opinion excess success and life at so cheap a rate that they will not sue their enemies by petitions or the show of sorrow but wear their own habitual greatness scipio charged with peculation refuses to do himself so great a disgrace as to wait for justification though he had the scroll of his accounts in his hands but tears it to pieces before the tribunes socrates condemnation of himself to be maintained in all honour in the Britannium during his life and sir thomas more's playfulness at the scaffold are of the same strain in beaumont and fletcher's thieve voyage juletta tells the stout captain and his captain and his company juletta why slaves tis in our power to hang ye master very likely tis in our powers then to be hanged and scorn ye these replies are sound and whole sport is the bloom and glow of a perfect health the great will not condescend to take anything seriously all must be as gay as the song of a canary though it were the building of cities or the eradication of old and foolish churches and nations which have cumbered the earth long thousands of years simple hearts put all the history and customs of this world behind them and play their own game in innocent defiance of the blue laws of the world and such would appear could we see the human race assembled in vision like little children frolicking together though to the eyes of mankind at large they wear a stately and solemn garb of works and influences the interest of these fine stories have for us the power of a romance over the boy who grasps the forbidden book under his bench at school our delight in the hero is the main fact to our purpose all these great and transcendent properties are ours if we dilate in beholding the greek energy the roman pride it is that we are already domesticating the same sentiment let us find room for this great guest in our small houses the first step of worthiness will be to disabuse us of our superstitious associations with places and times with number and size why should these words athenian roman asia and england so tingle in the ear where the heart is there the muses there the gods sojourn and not in any geography of fame massachusetts connecticut river and boston bay you think paltry places and the ear loves names of foreign and classic topography but here we are and if we will tarry a little we may come to learn that here is best see to it only that thyself is here and art and nature hope and fate friends angels and the supreme being shall not be absent from the chamber where thou sittest epimnondus brave and affectionate does not seem to us to need olympus to die upon nor the syrian sunshine he lies very well where he is the jerseys were handsome ground enough for washington to tread and london streets for the feet of milton a great man makes his climate genial in the imagination of men and its air the beloved element of all delicate spirits that country is the fairest which is inhabited by the noblest minds the pictures which fill the imagination in reading the actions of pericles xenophon columbus bayard sydney hampton teach us how needlessly mean our life is that we by the depth of our living should deck it with more than regal or national splendor and act on principles that should interest man and nature in the length of our days we have seen or heard of many extraordinary young men who never ripened or whose performance in actual life was not extraordinary when we see their air and mien when we hear them speak of society of books of religion we admire their superiority they seem to throw contempt on our entire polity and social state theirs is the tone of a youthful giant who is sent to work revolutions but they enter an active profession and the forming colossus shrinks to the common size of man the magic they used was the ideal tendencies which always make the actual ridiculous but the tough world had its revenge the moment they put their horses of the sun to plough in its furrow they found no example and no companion and their heart fainted what then the lesson they gave in their first aspirations is yet true and a better valor and a purer truth shall one day organize their belief or why should a woman liken herself to any historical woman and think because sappho or savigny or de stal or the cloistered souls who have had genius and cultivation do not satisfy the imagination and the serene themis none can certainly not she why not 
she has a new and unattempted problem to solve perchance that of the happiest nature that ever bloomed let the maiden with erect soul walk serenely on her way accept the hint of each new experience search in turn all the objects that solicit her eye that she may learn the power and the charm of her newborn being which is the kindling of a new dawn in the recesses of space the fair girl who repels interference by a decided and proud choice of influences so careless of pleasing so wilful and lofty inspires every beholder with somewhat of her own nobleness the silent heart encourages her o oh, friend never strike sail to a fear come into port greatly or sail with god the seas not in vain you live for every passing eye is cheered and refined by the vision the characteristic of heroism is its persistency all men have wandering impulses fits and starts of generosity but when you have chosen your part abide by it and do not weakly try to reconcile yourself with the world the heroic cannot be the common nor the common the heroic yet we have the weakness to expect the sympathy sympathy of people in those actions whose excellence is that they outrun sympathy and appeal to a tardy justice if you would serve your brother because it is fit for you to serve him do not take back your words when you find that prudent people do not commend you adhere to your own act and congratulate yourself if you have done something strange and extravagant and broken the monotony of a decorous age it was a high counsel that i once heard given to a young person always do what you are afraid to do a simple manly character need never make an apology but should regard its past action with the calmness of phocian when he admitted that the event of the battle was happy yet did not regret his dissuasion from the battle there is no weakness or exposure for which we cannot find consolation in the thought this is a part of my constitution part of my relation and office to my fellow creature has nature covenanted with me that i should never appear to disadvantage never make a ridiculous figure let us be generous of our dignity as well as of our money greatness once and forever has done with opinion we tell our charities not because we wish to be praised for them not because we think they have great merit but for our justification it is a capital blunder as you discover when another man recites his charities to speak the truth even with some austerity to live with some rigor of temperance or some extremes of generosity seems to be an asceticism which common good nature would appoint to those who are at ease and in plenty in sign that they feel a brotherhood with a great multitude of suffering men and not only need we breathe and exercise the soul by assuming the penalties of abstinence of debt of solitude of unpopularity but it behooves the wise man to look with a bold eye into those rarer dangers which sometimes evade men and to familiarize himself with disgusting forms of disease with sounds of execration and the vision of violent death times of heroism are generally times of terror but the day never shines in which this element may not work the circumstances of man we say are historically somewhat better in this country and at this hour than perhaps ever before more freedom exists for culture it will not now run against an axe at the first step out of the beaten track of opinion but whoso is heroic will always find crises to try his edge human virtue demands her champions and martyrs and the trial of persecution always proceeds it is but the other day that the brave lovejoy gave his breast to the bullets of a mob for the rights of free speech and opinion and died when it was better not to live I see not any road of perfect peace which a man can walk, but after the counsel of his own bosom, let him quit too much association, let him go home much, and establish himself in those courses he approves. The unremitting retention of simple and high sentiments in obscure duties is hardening the character to that temper which will work with honor, if need be, in the tumult or on the scaffold. Whatever outrages have happened to the man to men may befall a man again, and very easily in a republic, if there appear any signs of a decay of religion, coarse slander, fire, tar, and feathers, and the gibbet, the youth may freely bring home to his mind, and with what sweetness of temper he can, and inquire how fast he can fix his sense of duty, braving such penalties, whenever it may please the next newspaper and a sufficient number of his neighbors, to pronounce his opinions incendiary. 
It may calm the apprehension of calamity in the most susceptible heart to see how quick a bound of nature has set to the utmost infliction of malice. We rapidly approach a brink over which no enemy can follow us. Let them rave, thou art quiet in the grave. In the gloom of our ignorance, of what shall be, in the hour when we are deaf to the higher voices, who does not envy those who have seen safely to an end their manful endeavor? Who that sees the meanness of our politics, but inly congratulates Washington that he is long already wrapped in his shroud and forever safe, that he was laid sweet in his grave, the hope of humanity not yet subjugated in him? Who does not sometimes envy the good and brave, who are no more to suffer from the tumults of the natural world, and await with curious complacency the speedy term of his own conversation with finite nature, and yet the love that will be annihilated sooner than treacherous, has already made death impossible, and affirms itself no mortal but a native of the deeps of absolute and inextinguishable being?' 